Patriot program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Calling all cars, attention all Los Angeles County Sheriff's cars, Golf Cat 170. Investigate a bank robbery and shooting at the Southern County's Bank. 237 West Main Street, El Monte. That's all. Rose and Clifton. satisfied to go through life practically without drama or excitement. But the fact that you are tuned in here to enjoy the thrilling exploits of hard-hitting police officers shows that you want action. Thousands of motorists agree that Rio Grande Cracks Gasoline gives the liveliest performance they have ever experienced. It should. It is the only gasoline you can buy that is refined by the patented Sinclair cracking process. This breaks up gasoline into finer atoms that burn more completely and give greater power. This is why Rio Grande Cracks gasoline with tetraethyl gives police car performance. This is why more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment use Rio Grande Cracks gasoline wherever it is sold than any other brand. So, if you like your automobile driving, as you like your radio entertainment, with plenty of vigorous action... Take advantage of all that the Rio Grande Oil Company offers. Tune in every week to these thrilling broadcasts and go into an independent Rio Grande service station every time you need gasoline. If you enjoy the one, you will appreciate the other. Once again, Sheriff Eugene Biscalou, head of the Los Angeles Sheriff's Office. Sheriff Biscalou. Thank you. Good evening. Tonight, Calling All Cars brings you a story of a deception so incredible that it is hard to believe. It is a case that started out with a bang, then settled down to becoming one of the most involved we have ever experienced. It took many long months of patient investigation on the part of our office as well as the local El Monte and Pasadena officials to clear the many contradictory phases that insisted on cropping up. From the very beginning, we had a feeling that our man was lying, but due to the amazingly clever deception he had been carrying on, proving it turned out to be a really tough job. How it was done will be told on tonight's story of the Banker Bandit. opens in El Monte, California, on the last day of January, 1936. It is just past closing, and inside the Southern County's bank at 237 West Main Street, the manager is straightening his desk, preparatory to leaving. A few feet away at another desk, his secretary, Alice Williams, is deep in phone conversation with Tilly Irvine of the El Monte Herald. Through the glass partition separating his office from the teller's cages, Manager Mountain notices two men, apparently making out deposit slips. Thinking they are no more than late depositors, he turns back to his desk. Listen dryly to his secretary's conversation. Certainly. I'd be glad to do anything I could to help. I know it. That's why I feel the way I do about it. I'm a bit poor, lady. I'm sorry, Tilly. Say that again, will you? Someone was talking in here and I couldn't understand it. Oh! Here you are, Mr. Oh, what, what, lady? Hang up that phone. Oh, what? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, now, both of you, walk around to the vault. If you don't start anything, you won't get hurt. What, but look here, man. I would advise you're doing as I say. I'm in a hurry. My friend out there in the lobby is also a little nervous. His finger might accidentally squeeze the trigger on his gun. You know what that would mean? Yes, yes, sir. Oh, of course. We'll, we'll go to the vault. Splendid. You lead me. I'll follow. I wouldn't try stepping on any alarm bells. 
was either. It mightn't be healthy. Oh, no. No, I, I, I wouldn't do that. Good. Move on, then. You too, lady. Now you open this vault for me. Come on, let's get that thing open. I'm in a hurry. I, I, I'm trying as fast as I can. You, you, you see, the man who usually does this, he's sick today. It, 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 it's all a bit new to me. Yeah, I know all about that, but you can open it all right. And I'd advise you to do it quickly, very quickly. <laughs> Officers of the El Monte Herald, an excited young reporter, phone in hand, reacts to the sudden noise he has heard. Goes into action. Hello? Operator. Operator, listen, get me the police station and then keep this line open. Please, this is an emergency operator. El Monte Police, Chris speaking. Hello, this is Kelly Irvine at the Herald. I think there's a holdup at the Southern County Bank. What? Yes, it's going on right now. I'm almost sure. Okay, Mr. Irvine, I'll get out there right away. And thanks for the tip. Oh, that's all right. I'm in a better hurry. I'm going to call the constable's office. Constable's office. Who's well, speaking? This is Kelly Irvine at the Herald, Constable. There's a robbery going on over at the Southern County Bank. I just got to the police department. I thought I'd better call you. No, hello. Wait a minute. There's so much noise here, I couldn't get that. Will you? There's a bank robbery at the Southern County Bank. It's going on now. Are you sure of that? Yes, I'm almost positive. I called the police already. Oh, all right, Kelly. I'll get the rest later. Thanks. Uh, Wiggins? Yes? Yeah. Come on. I just got a report of a bank robbery at the Southern uh, County Bank over on Main Street. We're going out on it. With the El Monte police on the way, the constable's office notified, the quick-witted reporter continues to call. The Alhambra police, Ontario, Temple, and San Dimas officials are notified in rapid succession. And as a result, within five minutes of the interrupted phone call, various peace officers converge from all directions on the little bank at 237 Main Street. Arriving there first, Officer Frisch is soon joined by Wigan, Thompson, and Fowle of El Monte, Officer Cox of Alhambra, and Officer Stone of Ontario. Together, the men approach the bank. Keep your guns handy. I'm going to try the door. It's locked from the inside. I can't see anything on account of these blinds. Well, they must still be in there. I'm going to shake the door. Get set for trouble. Line your guns on the door. They try rushing us. The left is ready. Ready. All right, all right, boys. You've got us, don't shoot. Put your hands up back into the bank. Keep your guns on those men, boys. Let them have it if they start anything. Don't worry, we won't try any funny business for them. We know when we'll let you follow them. All right, then keep your hands high over your head. Give me your hands, Hustle. Oh, I'll tie this heavy boy up so he can't start anything, even if he wants to. Okay, here they are. Now, first the other fellow, someone. Hurry up. See what he has on him. I'll take him down. Come on, keep your hands up and don't make any fast moves. Come on up there. Get your hands up or I'll shoot. Look where I put you. Let him have it, boys. Let him have it. Hey, is anybody hurt? The guy who came in is more than hurt. He's dead. I, I think I'm hitting a hand. Oh, here, somebody gets straight over to the receiving hospital. You get that hand dressed. Oh, that's all right. Hey, hey where's that fellow I was frisking? Huh? Hey, he's got a gun. Where? Over in the corner. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, David, he's going down. Uh, I thought he got hit. Shot by one of his own men. You go into the hospital, Frisch. Send an ambulance back for this fellow. Oh, right. He's hurt plenty. That shotgun got him square. Well, uh, I tried to tell him, but not to shoot. Hey, who is he? One of your pals? He, he was my brother. The one who came in, your brother, huh? Yes. Well, how about this other fellow over here? The one your brother shot. Who's he? Uh, Clarence. Clarence Yates. He did, too. No, not yet. But he will be soon. That is... That would be my guess, yes. Well, I... Uh, I guess that's that. I uh, guess things are sort of... Sort of at an end. <laughs> not exactly what you'd call a very nice end, either. Removed to the El Monte Hospital, the wounded bandit dies shortly after arriving there. Frisch, the wounded officer, is found to be badly hurt in the hand, 
and it becomes necessary to amputate one finger. And as a result of the shooting, the one surviving member of the bandit trio, Frank Smith, is turned over to the Los Angeles Sheriff's Office for questioning. He is placed in jail and held incommunicado while deputies Cuno and Wofsky of the Bureau of Investigation make a search of the three bandits' homes. On this completed, Captain Bright, head of the Homicide Squad, finds himself in possession of a complete arsenal taken from the Smith Brothers' home. Guns, ammunition, a gas pencil, and several articles of jewelry. With this evidence in hand, he turns the case over to Inspector Stensland, who in turn questions Frank Smith. Present at the questioning are Captain Bright, Department of Justice official E.K. Merritt, Deputy Juno and Watsi, and M.C. Hardy, Deputy Reporter. All right, now what's your name? Frank Forrest Smith. How old are you? I'm 44. Have I been arrested before? And if so, for what? Well, I was arrested once in Glendale on a minor charge. Have I been arrested on a felony? No. Where did you work? Well, I was connected with the Hellman Bank. What was your position? Well, first as assistant cashier and then as manager at Ransburg, that's up in the desert. How long have you known E.C. Yates? Oh, about ten years, I guess. You have a brother, Clarence Smith? Yes, sir. You know they're both dead now? Yes. All right, go ahead and tell us just what happened today. Well, we went out there to rob this bank, and it was agreed that there'd be no shooting or bloodshed. Well, after we got in the bank, we both sensed that we were trapped, and I told Yates I was going to the door and for him not to shoot. Then I opened the door and told the officers to come in. Well, how did the shooting occur? Uh, we were standing in the lobby being searched, and all of a sudden my brother came in the door and yelled something, and then he started shooting. He only shot once, though. The officers shot him down. Your brother has been outside in the car? Yes, sir. Now, when did you first plan this holdup? Oh, I'd about two or three months ago. Who was present? Mm, Yates and I. Where was your brother? Well, he wasn't on it at first. Uh, we brought him in about a month ago. Hmm. When did you last put the bank over? Uh, this morning. How much does your wife know about it? Uh, not a thing. What does Yates' wife know about it? Well, I'm positive she doesn't know anything about it either. But well, it's going to be pretty bad for both women. Uh, they're not the type to be associated with a, a bank robber. Ever pull on the other jobs in this county, Frank? No, sir. You sure about that? Positive. How about a bank in Santa Monica? Oh, I know about it. Yeah, I read about it, but uh, I wasn't in on that holdup. How about a holdup on Washington Boulevard the other day? Uh, no, sir. Hey, who was on the job in Santa Monica, your brother? Uh, I don't know, sir. You understand that we have to bring your wife and Yates in to clear up the situation? Uh, yes, sir. Well, that is, uh, of course, unless you want to clear up the situation yourself about other jobs. Yes, sir, I understand it. Where were you born, Smith? Uh, in Idaho. Did you go to school there? Uh, yes. How far did you go in school? Well, one year of finishing school and then to, to a business college in Spokane. How many brothers have you? Just one. How old is he? Oh, about 42, I guess. What business was he in? Well, in a hotel. It was a bellhop. What had you been? Well, my previous business has been banking. 13 years of it in Idaho. Whereabouts in Idaho? Uh, up in Wallace. What's the idea of all the guns found at your house? Well, I had them when I was working at the bank. Why? Well, I just had them, that's all. And you never pulled any other jobs here? No, sir. Well, to get back to when you left school, what did you do then? Well, uh, I left school, and then I went into a bank at Spokane. Oh, I mean, Washington. I worked there for a while as assistant cashier. Then finally the bank changed hands, and I was relieved. And I went to Rosalia. And seated there in Stensland's office, Captain Bright beats Frank Smith to a long and detailed resume of his life for the last 20 years. Listen, while Smith tells of his banking experience, listen, and makes deep mental notes on little discrepancies that appear in the story. It is an amazing tale the bandit unfolds, a tale filled with changes of locale, of one job at a bank after another. And through it all runs one dominant strain. Smith's constant denial that his wife knows anything about his bank robbing proclivity. His equally constant denial that he has pulled other jobs in Los Angeles County. His occasional slips about having spent money quickly covered by his statements to the effect that it is money he has accumulated. But when asked how, 
he has no answer. Hour after hour, Stensland, then Bright, Barrett, then Cuno, Quentin Smith, repeatedly they ask the same questions over and over again, quietly, almost monotonously. And after several hours, this, Stensland brings the interview to an abrupt close. Motions the prisoner be taken back to jail. And when he has left the room, the officers compare notes. Exchange theory. That fellow's lying in his teeth. At least he is when he says he hasn't pulled any other jobs. Why, he's an old-timer in this racket. You can tell. Yeah, I feel the same way, Captain. But he's a tough one to crack. He knows that both his partners are dead and they can't testify against him. And as for his story about his wife not knowing, uh, frankly, I can't believe it. You better have a talk with her. Maybe she'll have a different set of answers. What do you think, Mary? How does Smith's story stack up with you? Until he explains where he got the money we know he had, I'm convinced he's lying. And I agree with you that he's a tough one to crack. Smooth as they make him. Well, I'm going to check with Glancy and have him and Cuno talk to Mrs. Smith and we'll see how the answers check with Frank. <laughs> short time later in Captain Bright's office, Deputies Rothke, Cuno, Bowers, and Lieutenant Penfrey question Frank Smith's wife. Check what Smith has told against her story. What is your name? Mary. Mary Smith. And what is your husband's name? Frank F. Smith. We're going to ask you some questions about your husband's past. Also probably some about your past. Are you willing to answer them? Yes. How long have you been married? About four years. What was your husband's business when you married him? Well, I... I don't know. Is it, you mean to say that you didn't know his business when you married him? No. You didn't know how he made his living? Did you question him at any time? Yes, sir. He said that he, he made investments. And that's how he made his money. Where were his offices, his place of business? But I... I don't know. Well, doesn't it seem strange that you didn't know his business address or occupation? Well, it does seem strange, but... Well, Mrs. Smith never said it. Yes. Does your husband own a car? Yes, sir. Due to make a sedan? Yes, sir. I, I think it's a 1933 model. Has it been painted lately? No, sir. You're sure of that? Well, I'm pretty sure. It hasn't been painted in the last few months. No, I, I, I'm sure it hasn't. Now, how were your allowances given you for running your home? He gave me a hundred dollars the first of each month. He's continued to do that right along? Yes. Did you ever suspect that your husband was a bank robber, Mrs. Smith? Oh, no. Would you tell us if you knew? Yes. Are you positive of that? Yes. You know now that he is a bank robber. Well, they... They just told me. And I... I can't believe it. I, I, I can't. His brother's dead, and so is Yates. They were both shot down. Well, you didn't kill his brother, and Yates. No, he didn't. But the officer did at the bank holdup. Oh, I, I don't know what to say or to do. Now, Mrs. Smith, do you expect a group of officers to believe your story? But it's the truth. Your husband gave you $100 every month. You didn't know where it came from. Yes. You didn't know what his business was or where it was. He said he made investments. Are you trying to get yourself implicated in these robberies? Oh, no. You want to clear yourself? Yes. Well, then why don't you start telling us the truth? But I am telling the truth. I swear it. Mrs. Smith, have you ever seen your husband with large amounts of money around the house? No, sir. Have you ever seen any guns around the house? Yes, sir. How many? Well, uh, there was a revolver on the bedstand, mm -hmm. and he had a skeet gun. Well, there, there were others. Quite a few others. Is that right, Mrs. Smith? Yes. Well, didn't that arouse your suspicions at all? All those guns lying around? Well, I, I asked him about them, but he said that one was for duck mm -hmm. and another for quail. Well, that's all. You marry a man who has no job who has a house full of guns. And all these years, you never knew where his money was coming from. You expect us to believe that? But it's the truth. That's all I can say. 
Did you ever hear your husband speak of any business deals with Yates? Yes. He said that sometimes Yates would borrow money and that he didn't like it. But he said he had it fixed so that he could get it back. How much of the time would he loan Yates? Oh, sometimes hundred dollars, sometimes fifty. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was Mr. Yates' business? Well, when I first met him, he was in the used car business. And how long did he stay in it after he met your husband? Uh, not very long. And after that, what did he live on? Nothing but... But my husband loaned him. He had no other means of support than that? None that I knew of. Did your husband and Yates spend a good deal of time together? Yes, sir. And you knew what they were doing, didn't you? You knew they were robbing banks. Oh, no. No, sir, I didn't. Did you know that Yates was robbing banks? No, sir. How about your husband's brother? Did you know he was robbing banks? No, sir, I didn't know anything about it. Oh, I can't tell you any more than I have. I don't know. I didn't know. <laughs> Subsequent questioning of both Yates' wife and the widow of Clarence Smith meet with the same denial. But Stensman is far from satisfied that his prisoner is an amateur. He is sure that he has pulled a long string of unsolved bank jobs on a list of cases marked unclosed. One job in particular is a bank in Santa Monica where two officers claim to have seen the bandit escaping. Accordingly, a phone call to Santa Monica brings them up. And after a careful study of Smith, they both identify him as the bandit. Faced with this, Smith is still unwilling to talk. Now, look, Frank. You've been identified by these two officers on that Santa Monica bank job. What have you got to say about that? Now, gentlemen, I I realize all that, and and I still say I've been telling the truth. Now, if I have to talk, there are a lot of things I could probably clear up. But I don't want to without a word to some attorney first. What are your intentions on the El Monte case? You going to plead guilty to that? Yes, sir. And Santa Monica, how about that? No. Frank, I'm going to tell you something. As far as state law is concerned, the government is going at one up when it comes to your wife. They can prosecute her to the limit. In in what respect, Captain? She's accepted money from you. Stolen money. Well, well yes, I suppose so. As it is now, I'll have to lock up all the women who just gets cleared up. Because there's still some money out of other banks that we've got to locate, and I'm asking you to help well, us. Well, I want to help you, Captain. I'm making no promises, only that we will file all the charges at once if you tell us what the rest of the job to go. Well, well, now listen. You gentlemen have me. And you know I'm not going to get away. I, I'll be here tomorrow morning. Now, I can promise that if I have any information to divulge, you'll all be present to hear it. What's your proposition? Well, I'm not propositioning you, Captain. I mean... I have a friend who happens to be a judge in Long Beach, and I'd kind of like to talk to him. Smith, I'm leaving in a few minutes. And when I leave, the boys will have orders to lock everybody up, and that includes your wife. And no one can change that order while I'm away, and I'll be back on the job early in the morning. And I can't see where you have anything to lose by talking now. Well, that's what I wanted to know, Captain. Why I wanted to talk to my friend down in Long Beach. Well, show me where you have anything to lose, sir. Well, I have two branches of the government and all you gentlemen on there. But this situation is so complicated and all that there may be things that you don't think of, and, well, I do. I believe a captain would be perfectly willing if you wanted to ask us some particular questions in regard to the federal end. Well, I would. Oh, well, I don't want to give the impression that these gentlemen are not fair and square, but I I do want to talk about the federal government. All right, go ahead, Frank. Ask them anything you want. Well, yeah, well, all right. Now, if you federal men will walk over to the other side of the room for a minute with me. Well, all right, then. You can put it down for the 
Santa Monica job. You and your brother and Jake? Yes, sir. All right, go on. And the uh, Citizens National on Wilshire. Yes. Well, only I wasn't in on that when it was Yates and my brother. Well, how many were you in on, Frank? Well, it was only two. The uh, Santa Monica job and that one today. All right. Give me a list of the ones your brother and Yates pulled, and don't forget any. No, sir. Well, there's, uh, oh, the Bank of America in Sawtell, the uh, Citizens National Bank in Hell. For several hours, Smith has questioned about various banks. As he admits his brother and Yates' participation, a check is made. And a little while later, he is asked to name them again. Slowly, little by little, his tired brain begins to get fuddled. His alertness slips. And at last, faced with the prospect of spending the rest of the night answering questions, questions that become harder and harder to answer, Frank Smith admits to 23 bank robberies, confesses that he has pulled five of these alone, the rest in company with his brother and Yates. And as the hand of the clock reaches 3 a.m., December 1st, 1923. Yes. You alone? No. All three of you. Bank of America, 54th and Mesa Drive, April 3rd, 1930. Yes, the 8th and 9th. Bank of America, Van Nuys, May 31st, 1928. Yes, alone. Bank of America, Van Nuys, February 15th, 1933. Yeah, all three of First National Bank, Alhambra, December 5th, 1928. Yes, alone. Well, that makes it, Captain. 23 of them. Well, Frank, for an amateur, you did pretty well. Yes, sir. Anything else you want to tell us before you go back to your cell? Yes, sir. My wife and the other women, they didn't know. Well, that was the hardest part of my job, keeping it from them. But believe me, Captain, I, I'm giving it to you straight. They didn't know. They didn't even have an idea. All right, Frank, I believe you. They'll be turned loose immediately, but I'll say this to you. I don't know how you did it, because it's just about the slickest bit of deception I've ever heard. Bar none. Frank Smith was tried on several counts of robbery and found guilty to all the charges. On top of this, he was found guilty of one count of murder in the first degree and three counts of attempted murder. This came as a result of his brother's shotgun sally intended for the officers, which killed Yates. Both Yates and Smith's brother being killed left the guilt directly on Smith's shoulders, an ironic twist which caused him to receive a life sentence in San Quentin Penitentiary. As warmer weather approaches, you will be taking longer trips than you've been taking the last few months. This is the time to insist on Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Nearly 300 police cars in Los Angeles drive more than 200 miles a day. And they've been using Rio Grande cracked gasoline for more than three years exclusively. The patented Sinclair cracking process breaks up gasoline into finer atoms so that you get more power and greater mileage. Rio Grande cracked gasoline is the only gasoline you can buy that gives police car performance. It has been specified month after month for the emergency equipment of Oakland. Berkeley, Marysville, Fresno, Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, Pasadena, San Diego, Phoenix, Santa Barbara County, Orange County, San Diego County, Maricopa County, Arizona, and now Monterey Park, California has joined the list. You will get better results, too, by using Sinclair Motor Oil. Sinclair Pennsylvania and Sinclair Opaline are both thoroughly de-waxed and de-jellied, and they come to you in refinery-sealed, tamper-proof cans. They flow freely, will not break down under terrific engine heat, and they save repair bills. Any car worth oiling is worth oiling well, so insist on Sinclair Motor Oil. If you haven't had your free copy of Calling All Cars News this month, drive into your nearest independent Rio Grande service station tomorrow and get one. It's brim full of exciting movie news and pictures, detective stories, radio schedules, and other special features. Get your copy tomorrow. <laughs> County Sheriff's Car, the cancellation broadcast 170, regarding a bank robbery and shooting. The 
suspects in this case are now in custody. That's all. Rose and Clerk. Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company. <laughs>